Hello and welcome to Libertas Europae. Today I want to talk to you about the American Revolution. That is the revolution of the North American British colonies between the years of 1775 and 1783. There's probably hardly any other revolution in our history that is more celebrated today in the popular imagination and in popular culture. And these popular portrayals of this conflict, typically very stereotypical, they cast the British as arrogant and cruel oppressors, and they greatly exaggerate the grievances of the British American colonists. So, for example, you can see this in the musical Hamilton, this very successful recent musical that portrays the loyalists as these pompous fools and... Uh, King George is actually portrayed as an abusive boyfriend, who, um, whereas America is portrayed as his um, his metaphorical girlfriend. And um, um, King George sings about how he wants to um, uh, force America to once again become his sweet, submissive subject, um, and um, that America is his to subdue, and so on. So we can see this extremely negative portrayal of the British and at the same time this is a very positive portrayal of the revolutionaries. But this stuff is highly misleading. So not only did the colonists have really insufficient cause for their rebellion, they also had long odds for success and it's not even quite clear in retrospect whether the revolution was worth it in hindsight. So if you want to evaluate the American Revolution or really any historical event, you need to differentiate between the ex-ante and the ex-post view. So from an ex-ante perspective, you want to ask ourselves um, whether the revolution was a good idea based on what people at the time knew and what they could reasonably expect. And from the ex-post perspective, we consider whether the outcome of the revolution was better or worse than the likely alternatives. So, going by what people knew at the time, the colonists should never have revolted. That is my claim, is that from an ex-ante perspective, the revolution is clearly a mistake. So, I talked about this previously in my video on revolution, linked up here that revolution is generally a mistake, it's almost, almost never works out for the better. And I set out like, four rules or guidelines for a successful revolution, and the American Revolution fulfills two out of four of these. And particularly the ones that it violates is that it's not actually a revolution against a particularly oppressive government. In fact, if you look at the time, the British government was one of the most liberal, one of the least oppressive governments in the world. And secondly, the odds of an American victory were not very good. So it was actually very likely that the revolution, even if it succeeded, would lead to something that's considerably worse, considerably more oppressive than these British colonies. And if the war had been led by someone less noble than George Washington, it's quite likely that the new government would not have become a republic. If he had wanted to, Washington could have probably made himself king or dictator. And in 1775, no one could reasonably have expected that the general chosen to lead the war would become the American Cincinnatus. This is a formulation that a lot of Americans um, adopted at the time, uh, referring to the ancient Roman dictator Cincinnatus, or as the Romans called him, Lucius Quinctius Quinquinatus. Cincinnatus was an impoverished patrician who lived on his small farm, but then when Rome faced an imminent invasion, he was chosen dictator, that is, he got uh, almost complete power, and um, led the Roman forces to a quick and decisive victory, and then this immediately resigned his dictatorship even though officially he could have uh, served out his full term of half a year, half a year of enjoying almost uh, unlimited power, but he didn't, he just returned to a small farm and resumed being a private citizen, and is often sort of held up by the Romans as this 
uh, exemplar of Republican virtue. Although historians um, question some of the particulars of his story, but uh, for our purposes, what's important here is that um, Washington did the same thing. Washington is the American Cincinnati. So after he'd won the war, instead of making himself dictator or king, he just stepped down from the Continental Army and became a private citizen once again. And then later, after he, he became president, uh, he decided not to run for a third term in office. And had he, had he not done that, had he just continued in office, he would certainly have been elected a third time and he would have likely died in office. And then this would have established the precedent that American presidents are kind of sort of elected for life. They are not expected to step down. They're these quasi kingly figures. But because Washington foresaw this danger, he stepped down from power and established this precedent that presidents only serve for two terms and then they step down. And even though that rule was not put down the constitution, the moment it was violated by FDR, who was elected four times, although he died very quickly in his, into his fourth term, as soon as FDR was dead and buried, they introduced an, an amendment to limit presidents to two terms, or at least two full terms. But anyway, the reason the American experiment was a success to the extent it was is largely because of George Washington's virtue, which is really not something you could have expected going in. And the colonists also beat the odds on other counts. So the Continental Army really was inexperienced, it was ill-equipped, it was disorganized, and it went up against one of the most effective fighting forces the 18th century had to offer, um, and a fighting force that was backed up by this giant global empire. But then after a long and bloody conflict, the colonists, with the help of their French and other allies, eventually managed to give the British enough of a bloody nose that they didn't really want to continue this fight anymore and just sued for peace and let the Americans go. But going in, this really wasn't a surprise. At the outset, most people didn't expect this result and the chances of victory really were slim. So the colonists got lucky. But does that make the revolution a success, seen from hindsight? So the US government did end up becoming one of the least oppressive and most successful governments in the world. But it's not clear whether cutting the ties with Britain really improved things. So for one thing, the revolution was originally a tax revolt. But the taxes levied by the federal government of this newly formed U United States very quickly came to exceed those that were levied formerly on the colonists by the British Empire. And yes, sure enough, it might not be technically taxation without representation, but for the individual small farmer, let's say, who is forced to pay a tax he doesn't agree with, does it really matter all that much whether he pays that tax because it was approved by strangers living on his side of the ocean or on the other side of the Atlantic? I don't know if that really makes much of a difference. So to judge the revolution in an ex post sense, we need to compare reality to what it would have been without the American Revolution, which is obviously a highly speculative endeavor because the American Revolution has such a fundamental impact on world history. For example, it's very unlikely that the French Revolution would have happened, at least at, at the time it happened and the way it happened, without the example of the American Revolution. So everything that follows is extremely speculative. But what we can do to give us some guidance is to look at the fate of the British colonies in North America that did not rebel. That is, at what is today Canada. Canada is today, in terms of GDP, a little bit less successful than, than the United States. Um, but in general, it's not, it's not a much worse country. It's, uh, really a matter of personal preference whether you like living in the US or in Canada better. But Canada, unlike the US, managed to achieve its independence peacefully without the need of any war or bloodshed. So one major case against American independence is the issue of slavery. 
So the British eliminated slavery in the empire in 1833, at least in most parts. There were some parts where it took until 43. Um, whereas the US took until 1865 to rid itself of slavery. Although, of course, um, there were a couple of states that abolished uh, slavery earlier, or that even were created as free states from the outset. So, if the American Revolution hadn't happened, there's a good chance that the abolition of slavery would have occurred 32 years earlier in these colonies, and it would not have come at the cost of such a horrific war that claimed something like 600,000 lives. In the end, though, the question of what would have happened without the American Revolution is unknowable. It's such a major event, it's profoundly influenced all of subsequent history, so it's really impossible for us to tell in retrospect whether it was a good or a bad development, whether things would have, got, would have gone better or worse for America had the revolution not happened. But at the very least, there's a good amount of doubt that we should have about whether the American Revolution really was worth all the blood spilled in it. And it really needs to be emphasized just how lucky the American colonists got. Their revolution really turned out about as well as could be hoped. The fact that even such a fortuitous revolution is not a clear success really nicely illustrates my point from this earlier video that violent revolution is almost never worthwhile no matter how noble the principles are you're fighting for. Thank you for watching. If you liked this video, give it a thumbs up and let me know in the comment section below what you thought about this video. And until next time, goodbye.